All right, uh, Coach Steven, welcome to the channel. This has been long anticipated for the last few weeks now. I just finally had my schedule opened up. I can finally have you on. Um, here is the thing. I wanted to ask you, first of all, the typical questions, but you are also known as, uh, according to you and many other people, the Bloods guy. You talk a lot about Bloods. And so that will be the focus, uh, primarily at least, with other, you know, inserted questions in between uh, other questions I have prepared for you uh, of this discussion. That will be the primary theme. So, of course, um, first things first, uh, who are you and why did you decide to go carnivore? That's a great question. And uh, I like your haircut, by the way. Um, the Bloods guy, I'm going to address that. I was very reluctant to have that as a tag. And um, I was at a conference and the one of the people there said, you are the Bloods guy. I'm coming to you. And I said, well, I don't really want to do that. And they said, well, you are. As simple as that. And then Richard Smith, my co-host, is always saying the same thing. And I suppose I do think about Bloods more than most people. And I think that is also linking into your uh, primary question is why did I become carnivore? Um, long story, which starts with me not believing carnivore whatsoever. Uh, I was one of those happily grain-washed people that believed in um, all the healthy things that the food pyramid offers me. And I did that for many, many years, up until age 50. I took a long time to wake up to what was going on, but I, I literally believed it all. Uh, skim milk, porridge oats in the morning, blueberries, you know, that superfood. Freshly squeezed orange juice, because freshly squeezed is great. Um and not eating red meat, not eating saturated fat. I was inherent uh, of all my parents eating proclivities because this is one of the things that does bug me about the genetic link, apparent a genetic link to diabetes. The nurturing side of things is always forgotten. You eat what your parents eat. And my, my parents did exactly that. They followed all the food guidelines and both died very young. Uh, that's how good the food guidelines are. So my mother died of colon cancer, even though what the vegans say gives you colon cancer, she didn't eat. And she ate all the things that all the vegans tell you to eat, which was fresh fruit and veg and lots and lots of fibre. And as her colon got worse and worse and worse, she was told to eat more and more fibre. And next thing you know, she's dead with a nine pound cancer growth. So if I sound a little bit bitter about that, I am. Even all these years later, here at 60, I still look back and think, wow, I could have done so much. But I didn't know, and I, I did fall for it. And I was very sporty. That's my, me winning a singles title in tennis, and then my medals were running. So it wasn't that I wasn't active enough. I was doing all the right things. So why did I get fatter and sicker? Pre-diabetic, lower left quadrant pain, uh, coronary artery, calcium scanner 639. Well, because I was eating all the wrong things. And uh, I trained in obesity and diabetes in my 40s. And I used to run a practice there. And it was thankfully the people there that were ignoring me that made me realise I was completely and utterly going down the wrong route. So I've got two degrees in my life. I've got an English honours degree and I've also got a science uh, honours degree, physiology and health sciences. Like I say, specialist practitioner in obesity and diabetes. And I also trained to be a phlebotomist because what was happening was the bloods were being interpreted by someone remote and then the doctor was adding their comments and it never matched up to the person. Never did. Even, you know, 15 years ago, I realised that there was some sort of disconnect. Uh, I now realise what it was all about. But anyway, um, it became apparent that everybody that was reversing their diabetes, and I was pre-diabetic at this point and getting a little bit fatter, even though I was running 10 miles uh, every day, uh, three times a week, basically, and doing all the activity. I also am an advanced personal trainer, so I was training people to a high level and eating all these foods. And I was giving people advice. And one out of ten, roughly, would come in and I would say, wow, you're looking really good. Your body composition's great. How are you getting on with your diabetic meds? Uh, and, of course, they were improving. And I just said, what are you doing? And they said, ignoring you. I'm doing a low carb or Atkins, as it was called then. Um, carnivore wasn't really a thing, not as a name, but it was around, I suppose. But And um, keto wasn't really that popular either, uh, even though that's how we're supposed to eat, ketogenically. So um, I got to age 50 and I thought, there's something wrong here. 
I'd had a scan, I'd had a colonoscopy and I'd been sitting in that room thinking that's my, my number's up. You know, my parents both died of uh, cancer, I'm going to. Uh, what can I do? And then I just suddenly realised I could listen to some other people that I've been looking at who are doing really well. So I'll go low carb. So I went low carb and as in all these stories, three or four weeks in, I was like, why did I not do this sooner? Because everything started to resolve. Niggly little things like very bad athlete's foot, which definitely is niggly. But when it's, you've had it 35 years and you've tried everything, like you're sort of uh, getting a hair dryer and drying between your toes and thinking, what could I possibly do more than all this powder and all this stuff and disinfecting everything? And uh, when that starts to go without any treatment whatsoever... Um, you realise, oh, this isn't too bad. And then your body composition improves. Obviously, you lose some water weight, but you also lose body fat and it stays off. And you're actually enjoying the food and you're not having loads of cravings um, and your uh, cataracts in your eyes aren't getting any worse and your hearing gets slightly better. I'm deaf, by the way, we're hearing aids and I've got uh, you know the captions on now and a big speaker and all that. But everything, everything, literally everything got better. And after three years of low carb... I was following people like Ken Berry, who sort of had this parallel existence as he went more keto. Um, I was still watching people like Eric Berg, who, whatever you want to say, I like him. Reasonably consistent content. Yes, some of it's wrong, but he's a good gateway drug to this way of eating. Um, and influencers like that. At this point, I had not heard of Sean Baker. I'd never even heard of Joe, Reg uh, Joe Rogan, and I'd not even heard of a ribeye steak. Right, that's how much I'd avoided red meat. Um, so I get to sort of two years of keto after three years of low carb and I think this carnival thing this is really good I've been uh, looking around Joe Rogan Sean Baker all that so I joined Sean Baker's sort of um, membership online membership it was called Meet RX as a basically as a coach I trained with Sean to do the fasting coaching and also the carnival coaching and within a couple of months you know, when he was not able to sort of front the meetings, I was stepping in and covering for Sean Baker, which is not a bad thing to do. He's, he's not a bad influencer to stand in for. Uh, but everything just got better and better. It, everything. It is literally, you know, the more I remove carbs, the better I felt. It's a perfect graph. Removing carbs, getting better. Absolutely nailed on that what I was doing was right now. People might say, well, did you give up smoking? Oh, I didn't smoke. Did you give up drinking? No, nope, didn't drink. I am a perfect experiment because the only thing I changed was the carbs. Was it because I started moving more? No, nope, because I had healthy user bias in my high carb days. I did it all. So the only thing, the only thing that changed was removing carbohydrates. And the more I removed them, the better I felt. So here I am, sort of uh, five and a half years later. It was a 30 day challenge. <laughs> to try carnival it was so convincing that here i am still doing it so i suppose the short answer is i did it for my health yeah so that's actually that's really interesting that's uh, awesome to hear as well that you're having you know continued benefits from the diet and you saw them uh some people it, it seems take a little while to see benefits for for some and then other people uh it seems even for you uh it's very very quick so you didn't really have to wait too long. Of course, I'm sure that, you, as you said, the longer you you were on it, though, the more started to resolve, and the better other things that were already resolving became more resolved. Um, I also originally came to the diet for health reasons, but it was a little different. And this isn't my, you know, the, this uh, I'm I'm not the guest, so I won't uh, I won't go into my story uh, too much at all. But I remember when I first heard about the carnivore diet, it was of course from. Uh, Jordan Peterson and Michaela Peterson. I heard that they were on such a diet, and I remember thinking, you know, okay, you know that that's that's good that you're on that and you felt better. Uh, good luck with your long term health. That's what it's what I always thought. I was like, well, good luck with that. <laughs> but of course, now we know that yes. that's that's uh, not exactly the best um, logic there. Um, in terms of diabetes, you mentioned diabetes being uh, colloquially deemed to be genetic. And you had said that so many people, when they say that it's genetic, they're completely failing to mention the fact that, you know, nature is not the only thing here. It's also nurture that is un invariably associated mm. with that. And I think that that's maybe it's 
a little contentious to say this, but many people still will insist that there is a genetic predisposition that you can have to diabetes. And I'm sure that that's probably true. There's genetic predispositions to everything, right? Uh, the problem is I don't think that you will necessarily, if you have certain genes that make you predisposed to that, develop diabetes if you're not giving yourself and inundating yourself with carbohydrates every single day, <laughs> all the, three times a day, every single day. So um, I wanted to ask you, you talked about your CAC score being quite high. Has that gone down since going carnivore? Or do you know that yet? Oh, well, um, I want to address the first bit about the genetics. Uh, but yes, I haven't had a retest. I've not retested because at the moment there's a huge waiting list for a coronary artery calcium scan in the UK. Uh, there never used to be a big waiting list, but there is now. So um, I don't want to biohack to take somebody else's place who's actually doing it for a serious health mm -hmm. issue. So I'll wait and wait for that. I want to go back to the genetics. Um, whenever I have somebody come off their diabetic medications, they've never changed their genetic makeup. They've never had a new set of DNA implanted. They've just changed their food. That's it. And it happens hundreds of thousands of times. People reverse type 2 diabetes. And uh, sorry to, to be a bit glib and sort of very broad, but they haven't changed their genetics. They've changed their food. It's that simple. Yes, I agree with you. Maybe there is a uh, predisposition within their genes. I, I am not sold on that either because I've done my 23 and me, and I'm supposed to be bald. I'm supposed to be. You know, I've done loads of tests. I'm apparently adverse to red meat, you know, so it's ridiculous. So, uh, but certainly my environment is showing, uh, if you want to say epigenetics or whatever you want to say, just changing my diet is a thing that's worked. I haven't changed my genes. That's it. Um, going back to the coronary artery calcium scan, that was uh, something I got into because I was having some rude awakenings at, at every test or every sort of appointment I did, whether it was about my heart, or my eyes. Um, you know, I didn't know I had cataracts, but I had cataracts at, at quite a young age, which I now understand is, you know, all to do with the polyol pathway and all that sort of stuff. So I got I, I went for an eye test and um, basically, you know, if you get these sort of things with with the very small writing on. Uh, maybe like where it's made or whatever down the bottom. Well, I was in my 40s. I couldn't read those things. And it, it, um, it was crazy because I'd had laser eye surgery many, many years before. And I wasn't expecting that. But I thought, oh, well, that's just aging, even with that surgery. I'm just aging. I can't read those, those, the small print. And uh, it was a cataract, which had crept up on me, which is also associated with um, prediabetes and those sort of conditions. Um, a lot, to, a lot to do with um, how glucose is managed by the non-insulin-dependent uh, glute receptors. But anyway, right. So um, th that made me really interested in other things. So then I started reading about calcium being in the wrong place. <laughs> so I had the coronary artery calcium scan a bit ahead of my time, I think. Uh, but that was 639. Yeah, that's pretty bad. Um, so going back to genetics, the modelling for that result means that I died about six years ago. Because that's that's what I should have done without school, you know. So it's just, it's it's one of those things that, you know, when when we get onto the bloods, there's so many assumptions that are just not true. But it's like that. If you repeat a lie long enough, it be, it becomes a fact, and it it it's it's very very frustrating. But I would like to get it retested, and I think a lot of people out there don't really understand what is the aim of the retest. Well, it'd be nice if it's reversed, but that isn't the be all and end all. Also, you can just slow progression because there is, going back to this sort of assumptions, there's an assumption of how much progression you would get. So maybe I'll just slow down the progression or maybe I'll stop progression but not have a regression. Um, but it, 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 it was a fascinating thing to do and I, I enjoyed doing the CAC. But uh, yeah, the retest I'll do when there's no waiting list. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think the, the last thing that I'll talk about before I actually get into bloods is exactly the, the problem that we see whenever people start talking about genetics in the first place. They act as if your genotype is the only thing that exists and there's no such thing as a phenotype. You know, the, the epigenetics that you were referring to were, yes, genes, you have a certain genotype that you cannot change, but 
that genotype, there are genes within your genotype that can be activated, deactivated, or somewhere in between in terms of the rate at which they produce a certain protein, which is the only thing that genes are responsible for doing, such as the genes responsible for encoding for the production of LDL. You know, just because you may have genes that are asserted, at least, to be responsible for producing LDL at a higher rate than you know, other people that don't have those genes, that doesn't mean that you will invariably necessarily produce that a certain amount of LDL at a given rate because that depends on the environment in which you place those genes, part of that environment being the diet you consume, for example. It's why people like Nick Norwitz can lower his LDL by eating Oreo cookies every day. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really that yeah. simple. So, yeah, I'm glad that we actually got uh, talking about that. Um, so I did want to ask your opinions so going towards the blood thing. And I know that you didn't want to have that title bestowed upon you as the blood guy, but, uh, you know, that is, that is the theme of the, of the discussion today. So <laughs> yep. okay. what are your opinions about the integrity of the HbA1c test for assessing excess glycation damage? Classic one. Oh, that sounds like a leading that sounds like a classic one. Yeah, it's atrocious. It is literally atrocious. Um, I want to go again. I'll, I'll, I'll just come out a bit to how we look at blood glucose in, in the main. And then we'll get into the HbA1c in particular. Everyone's really focusing on your average blood glucose. Well, what if your average blood glucose is 100? Let's just say 100. Is that the be all and end all of that question? Because we could look at your graph and it could be 150, then down to 50, then up to 150, down to 50, up to 150, and so on and so on. There's your average, 100. Well, what, is, that, is that going to be more damaging than, say, somebody who's 105, 95, 105, 95, you know? So average is not great. Average is exactly what that word entails. It's just an average. You don't want to be average. You want to be optimal, right? So we need to know a bit more about it. Second thing is, how did you get to that? average how did you get to 100 what's happening in the background with insulin so i've got a great video i could send you which is which shows a historic data of you know somebody's blood glucose being really great really great you know in the right range and average but in the background their their insulin is just going up and up and up and you could pretty much predict there was going to be a diabetic problem 20 20 years previous if you looked at their insulin so just blood glucose in, in general is, is looked at badly. In, the insulin-dependent GLUT4 transporter is ev what everyone focuses on. There are 11 GLUT transporters, of which one is insulin-dependent. So there's loads of other things that we could talk about. So there's a, a, a bit of a disconnect between when people talk about blood glucose and they talk about uh, you know, the HbA1c. So what is the HbA1c? Well, it's hemoglobin which has some sugar attached to it. So you get the Hb, haemoglobin, and uh, the A1c is just the type once that uh, sugar is stuck to it. And the idea is it gives you a good idea of the average over, over three months. So we can say, ah, oh, this person's got a lot of glycation going on, therefore they're, they're eating too much glucose and they're going to be diabetic, and then we get these arbitrary, they are arbitrary ranges. Um, and it's really frustrating because it's a calculation. And it's a calculation with a big flaw in it. So when I started with phlebotomy, and you have to stick with me with this because it comes the through line of logic is, is there, you were told about artificially low HbA1Cs and why you should ignore them. And the biggest one was hemolytic anemia, which is people who have a red blood cell lifespan much shorter than you would expect. Well, why is that? Well, well because the calculation's wrong. Uh, there isn't enough time to get the glycogen glycation and the calculation is based on the life of the red blood cell lasting longer than that so it doesn't work so you have to use other tests fasted glucose fasted insulin c peptide so that's what you're told you're actually told that so when i started carnivore in particular and people were coming to me with continual glucose monitors which incidentally when i started 15 years ago they didn't want you to have in your hands they didn't want you to monitor your own glucose for many reasons all of them nefarious i promise you um they were saying, well, my average blood glucose when I do my finger pricking and when I do my continual glucose monitor does not match my HbA1c. So I'm diabetic. And I'm like, you're not. Because your daily blood glucose, which you are, it's your blood that you're taking from your finger and you're getting a reading. And I've had people with two different monitors and a continual glucose monitor because they were so worried about the HbA1c. Well, this was five years ago. Uh, I think they don't do that now because too many people are 
bringing this up, even the labs, by the way, um, it's misleading because your red blood cells are living longer. So if you can have an artificially low HbA1c because they, they live too, uh, too short, and if they live too long, you can have an artificially high one. And that, that's really it. It's really not a good measure because of that basic calculation. And you can also prove how long your red blood cells are lasting. You can have a reticular site count. And that is showing you from your bone marrow how much production of red blood cells are there. And, and that's nailed on. So you can get this from data, some people actually pricking their fingers, wearing a continual glucose monitor, all saying that their average blood glucose is low. You can also do the reticular site count to prove that your red blood cells are living longer. So the HbA1c is absolutely irrelevant. Now, that's now beginning to be put in labs. I mean, I'm lucky. I have a lot of clients from around the world, so I see lots of different labs. Some are not there. Some are still using red flags and lots of warnings, whereas others will put literally what I just said, but in more technical language, that the life of your red blood cells or the recycling, redistribution, whatever they, whatever words they use, is basically saying this isn't the be-all and end-all. You should not diagnose using this now. Um, you need to do other tests. It's actually in there. So is it, is it good? No, it's, it's not good. It's certainly not good in this way of eating. Because that's the other thing. If we can just, again, take a step back. Normative ranges are just that. They're not optimal ranges. They're normative ranges. So all ranges in bloods are based on assumptions from a particular cohort of people and they tend to be eating 45 to 65 percent carbohydrates and they tend to be sick in some way if you go down into the, your town and count 500 people and you had a clipboard and you're sad um how many of those would you go oh they're optimal they look fantastic i guarantee out of 500 you'd be lucky to see five all right so but they're the the, the 495 are the people giving blood because right, the five that are really healthy don't really give blood, they're not in hospitals. So that's what you're setting your targets against, and it's ridiculous. And, so, and what I've found is the more and more you get into this, the more those ridiculous normative ranges and assumptions mess up most of the key markers. And HbA1c is obviously a big one because diabetes has a knock-on effect of, of your own health and your kidney health and people around you, whether you have to buy... Um, uh, you know medications or kit and stuff like that well maybe you're not diabetic and this this is definitely what's happening i'm definitely getting that with clients now waking up to this and saying uh this is my fasted glucose this is my readings from my continual glucose monitors i'm not i'm not worried about me hba1c and and rightly so they shouldn't be yeah not to mention with respect to blood tests and the normative ranges those are based upon um populations that not only seem to be extremely metabolically deranged, but most people getting bloods done, I believe, are people that probably think they need them because they're, they're presenting with symptoms. So they are symptomatic. How many people are not getting bloods done because they're totally not symptomatic? They're asymptomatic. You know, it's people that actually show up to get bloods done um, that are, in many cases, sick. Um, so that's also something that is not accounted for. And I'm also glad that you're mentioning that really there's only one glute transporter out of, you said 11, I actually believe that there's 14 glute transporters, because uh, I saw this a long time ago, uh, that, is, that is insulin dependent. Now, sure, there's others that are, you know, not really involved in glucose metabolism, but fructose and stuff like that. But, you know, there's th the other three out of the main four are glucose dependent and not insulin dependent. And I think you mentioned it whenever mm. you were talking about, you know, eye health where you mentioned the polyol pathway, where that is really when it comes to things like the cells of the retina and the kidneys and stuff like that, they've got a lot of, I believe, especially the kidneys, I definitely know this with the kidneys, it's glucose dependent transporters. And so actually completely irrespective of insulin's concentrations, if you raise glucose enough, those are the organs that you see that are really susceptible to cligation damage before anything else is. It's because you raise that glucose concentration. It doesn't matter what the insulin is. They will keep taking a lot of that glucose up and trying to inoculate it by, you know, things like this, the polyol pathway mainly. But they still suffer suffer damage. Um, also, we were talking should about... Should we explain what that... So, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. Should we explain to what the pathway is? Yeah. Because I think one of the things I like to get into, I mean, you're very sciencey and that's why I love you. I think you're great and also you do make it quite bite-sized, which is good. But um, 
if we again, you know, take a step back, what what are the firstly, what are the symptoms of diabetes? The old fashioned way. Well, you you drink a lot. Okay, well, what is your body doing? Why is it doing that? Well, it's trying to dilute the sugar in your blood, all right, because you've got too much glucose in your blood. Why do you urinate a lot? <laughs> it's trying to get the glucose out of your blood, right? Now, there's the theme. What's the polyol pathway do? There's too much glucose in the blood, <laughs> right? So it shifts it into a different pathway and it just changes it into sorbitol and uh, the fructose a little bit as well, as you said. So it's just another mechanism. It's another mechanism, certainly not talked about, but we're always talking about, oh, well, you've got to put glucose into your liver. Yes, yeah, true, into your muscle, yeah. But do you know what? All of these things, and I'm uh, oh, sorry I cut you off, I feel really bad about it, but all of these things are down to you eating too much glucose. <laughs> I mean, in, in the end, this body is fighting this concentration of glucose. And we, we talk about all these pathways. Why are they being activated? Because you're eating too much glucose. I mean, that's it. And if you've got these things that are jettisoning the health of your eye, and we could go into the pathways, I don't really want to do that. I mean, it's, it's all about, you know, osmolarity, osmolarity and drawing in water into your lens and all that sort of stuff. The, the bottom line is it's sacrificing bits of your body to protect your major organs. Do you know what? Stop all that. Stop talking about that. Not you personally, but stop trying to justify it and stop eating so much glucose. We won't have to worry about the polyol pathway. We won't have to worry about that. Um, you know, this is this is it when you're talking about other organs there. You know, th if someone comes to me and I, I, I have this with people that I coach, they are at, they have kidney function down at three, five. You know, really bad, uh, some of them peritoneal dialysis, some have had transplants. Once you, once you manage the diabetes, you manage their kidney problems. That happens. So, you know, I've had somebody go from... Uh, a kidney function, or oh, GFR, we might be getting to that, of 14 up to 128. <laughs> you know, th this is not a small amount. This is a huge amount. Uh, somebody that was told they had two weeks to live, two weeks to live in 2019, so that was a long time ago. They definitely got that wrong, uh, the doctors there. Two weeks to live, so really bad on, on dialysis. And within three weeks of eating this way, they came off the diabetic meds. Within four weeks, they're off their high blood pressure meds. Within six weeks, they're going to the eye doctor, and the eye doctor's like, I don't understand. Six weeks. Yes, I know. And for those that are watching, these are quick numbers, all right? This isn't going to happen to you, but it does happen. The point I'm making is this person was very sick, had a really bad kidney, and nobody was addressing why is your kidney not working as well as it should. And that was because they were eating all the wrong foods. To the point where I now don't got this kidney protocol i'm quite happy to give it out you know if you give people my email address i will send them the protocol it's completely free i'm not trying to make big bucks out of this and it literally just tells you what the point is of doing this and the 10 foods you can eat of which six are not carnivore by the way just to show it i'm not pushing carnivore it it does end up that people tend up to go to the carnivore stuff and there's 10 foods not to eat now the 10 foods not to eat whenever i talk to anyone with a bad kidney there's always laughter because they're like well that was that was his diet that's what he ate and so well there's the proof of the gun yeah <laughs> these 10 foods are terrible and it it's so simple that people are not doing this joined up thinking all the time and it's a bit like um you could have a pain in your shoulder but is it your shoulder or is it coming from your spine? You know, you, you, you can't just go, Whoa, it's probably just rub the shoulder. What's causing the shoulder to ache? You know, very often when you have a shoulder problem, it's the other side. But that's another thing. Um, so, oh, well, you know that from all the things you've gone through. You know, you don't have a localised pain without a cause. So, um, sorry, I, I jumped in there because, that is, you know, this is what we do. We talk about these pathways but what is the what is the reason they're being talked about is be, is because we are bringing them into activation because the body's so smart it's got these uh, pathways to to help out but I don't think the body was expecting stupid humans to eat so many <laughs> so many carbohydrates so it's beginning to you know burst at the seams which is which is what we're seeing we're seeing so many people fat and obese you know diabetes is is very prevalent high blood pressure um kidney function kidney failure it's just it's mind-numbing it's mind-numbing what's happening but anyway sorry eddie i i interrupt you no that, that's fine i think you and i both have the tendencies to really really dig 
like just deep into the 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 specifics of sentences. So I'm actually I'm 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 glad to see that you do. I'm not the only one. Uh, and and I I like this because we're actually you know it, it's substantial. We're gonna have substance of this in this. Um, the thing I'm really glad that you just talked about how it always goes back to glucose. We can start talking about reductionistly these certain pathways and this and that. Or I mean it goes right back to the whole topic of insulin resistance and stuff like that. You know, people focus so much on insulin resistance. Well, what is what is the main cause of this phenomenon going on? What does it all tie right back to? Because you can pretend like it's fat and all that stuff because, oh, well, fat may worsen an insulin response or uh, a glucose-mediated insulin response or whatever, um, and glucose uptake at the behest of insulin. Well, it's always in conjunction with what? What are we talking about? What is always present in this situation? Is it glucose? Well, yes, it is, actually. That, that's, <laughs> that's what the problem is. Um, and the other thing you said that lots of people, and you're right, lots of people will talk about, well, yes, when you consume glucose, before all these problems happen, first, yes, you, you'll get uh, glycogen replenishment in your muscles and your liver first before anything like this stuff will start happening. And I go, well, so what? That doesn't, that doesn't matter. So great. We, our body has a, cap a, a, a capacity to store glucose in a form that is non-toxic before it becomes toxic. Well, guess what? Our bodies also have the capacity to withstand a certain amount of everything before it becomes toxic, like cyanide. Uh, of course, it's a lower concentration, mm. vastly lower than glucose, and the body can't really work with cyanide as much as it can with glucose because glucose is actually involved in metabolism as cyanide isn't. I know that there are incong incongruencies or incongruencies with that and glucose, but that's not the point. The point is neither of those things are required, exogenously speaking, at all. So instead of talking about, and, and, and above a certain physiological concentration, they are harmful to the body. So instead of talking about what that threshold is, which varies person to person, by the way, in terms of how much they'd have to consume and all that stuff, so it makes it even more difficult to assess, why don't you just not consume it? Why don't you just get rid of it so you don't have to consider the polyol pathway and glycation damage and even think about, you know, HbA1c readings in the first place? Because in reality, we use that to assess excess glycation damage, which is a bad thing. But whatever that HbA1c value is, outside of the context of carbohydrate consumption and, you know, extreme, let's say, inflammation that would cause the liver to release more glucose to maybe an excessive degree, uh, you know, excessive, and then you start talking about how the body doing it, it's not in excess. But uh, it's not, it's not um, really a good marker at all, like you were just talking about. And... Like you said, not only can it be artificially higher, but it can be artificially lower. And I believe it was the first person I heard that from uh, in terms of a reasoning why that isn't really the most talked about, I don't think, in the space is uh, it was Paul Mason. I saw him talking to Ken Berry on a live stream. And he had said that one of the things that may cause a decrease uh, rate of, of red blood cell lifespan, which would which would artificially lower an HbA1c over time, um, it could very well be the phenomenon of phytosterol administration into cells instead of cholesterol. So we know that cholesterol makes up, you know, a large portion of cell membranes, you know, 50% of every cell membrane of every single cell in the body. And we know that our red blood cells are very concentrated in, in cholesterol compared to other cells. Uh, they're very high in cholesterol. Well, we know that there are these things in plants called phytosterols that are very, very similar in structure to cholesterol, and they will, they can be incorporated into into cellular structures. Now, in terms of, at least from what I've seen, uh, in terms of, they actually will cause a disruption of the structure of cells. I feel like that's common sense that it does, but in terms of absolute definitive evidence that I've seen in literature, no, I haven't seen that. But we know that phytosterol administration seems to be a conducive approach to lowering cholesterol levels over time. And we know that things like plant toxins, like glycoalkaloids, will disrupt the structure of cholesterol in cell membranes because they, they can bind to cholesterol in uh, lipid rafts. And, uh, it will cause the cells to either leak or burst. And so if you're causing excessive damage to red blood cells over time, and you're shortening their lifespan, that may very well artificially lower your HbA1c as well. So you've got all these different variables, you've got all these different confounders to, that make it completely, you know, it renders it useless in many ways, the HbA1c. Like you were just talking about, there's many, many different reasons as to as to why that would be the case. Um, I don't know if there's anything more that you want to add to what I just said before I move on to the next uh, major question yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I think that's a great 
a great point because one of the things that um, those that are proponents of vegan and vegetarianism um, they say look at my HbA1c let's just do a thought experiment let's say we never even heard of HbA1c and someone's got high HbA1c but they know they wouldn't know yeah, they they wouldn't unless they were urinating a lot and and drink and drinking a lot. You know, so there's that there's that. So you could be thinking you've got this low HBA one C, but it isn't. It's artificially low, and it's exactly what I just said about the hemolytic anemic people. They could be having way too much glucose, and it's exactly the same with the vegan, vegans. They're having way too many plant sterols, so their red blood cells are dying earlier, and they think they're golden, and then they get diabetes. And that, that's it. I mean, the thing is, and again, Eddie, I love how dense, densely you go into it. Sometimes I, I think the yin and yang is really nice. When you, when you paraphrase what like, people like uh, Gregor are saying, uh, fat is the demon because it takes space away from eating glucose. I mean, basically, when you watch any of their lectures, uh, that is what they are saying. Um, you've got to make way for the glucose. So... It, no, let's just not have the glucose. Then we haven't got anything to worry about. And I, I, I feel the, the red blood cell is, I mean, it's a fantastic thing to measure, all right? But when you think that 70% of healthcare decisions are based on laboratory results, we are literally taking four teaspoons full of blood from our 12 pints, putting it in a little tube and making all our decisions based on that sample that snapshot in time, irrelevant of your hydration status, what you've eaten that day, did you break the eight-hour fasting rule, whatever, 70%. So seven out of ten people are getting big decisions made on this small amount of blood from this small amount of time with limited understanding of the ranges and no joined-up thinking whatsoever. You know, So it, it is worth talking about, even though it's just blood and it's just a lab and it's just a snapshot and all that. My big issue is interpretation. It's not with the science behind how they work out the concentrations, what they do, whether it's an amino assay or a, whether it's uh, you know high pressure, whatever it is. However, they're guessing the results. I'm fine with that. I think I think the science is pretty good at getting the numbers uh, in the main. But what do you do with the numbers? What do they actually mean? And there's many numbers that we talk about, uh, high this, high that, and it's in high in inverted commas, by the way, because that's a you know, pejorative term. And, uh, and it's, it's, not, it's not the reality. It is somebody's opinion based on many assumptions. And once you start with the false premise and then you extrapolate out, you end up with something that's completely irrelevant. And that's what I was seeing even before I really got into it. And now I've had over, you know, like a thousand clients and loads of data points and lots and lots of proof and things changing in real time. Watching people, I, I, you know, I've got a couple of clients very lucky in that they can afford a lot of bloods and we can follow stuff and say, you know, you've been told this xyz marker is is high and it's dangerous but actually what it's doing is degrading so this is the plaque test plact test um it's associated with cardiovascular risk is it well no it's actually high because it it degrades oxidized ldl of course it's there if someone's got oxidized ldl but it's doing a job and that's the other thing there's so many things where they put the cart before the horse or they don't do the joined up thinking or even say, why is it like that? I mean, high blood pressure would be absolutely one of those things because, you know, I'm old enough to remember age related blood pressure. It was not 120 over 80. It was your age plus 100. And that seemed to do really well. You know, if you study people that are powerlifters, their blood pressure momentarily will be 400 over 200. It's responsive. It responds. You know, I always use the corny example of the giraffe with a very long neck. Well, that's a genetic advantage. It will have higher blood pressure than the rest of those giraffes in that enclosure or wherever it is because it needs higher blood pressure to get the blood to the brain and to get, you know. So, so, so once you start thinking, well, that makes common sense, there shouldn't be a one size fits all, there shouldn't be a number. Um, your blood pressure goes up as you get older because your arteries, whatever way you're eating, uh, the walls will stiffen. 
So if anyone knows about uh, the flow of fluids, if you've got a nice bendy elastic hose pipe, you don't need so much pressure to get the water through as if it's all stiff and old. You have to, you know, like me at 60, you know, you have to really, really turn that dial up to get the same amount of water coming out. You just have to put the pressure up. So I think that's... You know, one of the things I really hate, apart from me saying you know about eight times, is we just accept all this, it's high this, it's low that, and really, I just ended up thinking, nobody is looking at this and joined up, well, not nobody, I mean, you just said about Paul Mason, for instance, a great example of someone that doesn't accept the status quo and look into things a bit more deeply, and uh, Ben Bickman might be another one that comes to mind. I looked at the bloods in relation to the people and what happened and why are they going higher. And the more you do it, the more you realise hey, there's really good reasons for some of these things and it shouldn't be scaremongering. I mean, on the genetics, yes, there are genetics that will cause like sickle cell or something like that. But in the main, the mainstream uh, badge of this is a genetic disease with obesity, for instance, or it's a genetic disease, diabetes, is that that's just not true. That's not true, borne out by real life experience uh, of people reversing their type 2 diabetes and, and improving their condition of their heart. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad that you're also talking about how blood tests, you still need context. You can't just look at the test and then immediately be able to assess someone or, or, or claim to be able to either pretend any, yeah, portend any heart health outcomes or deleterious heart health outcomes in the future, or be able to assess someone's immediate current health based on that one blood test. Um, it all goes back to the thing that I always say, which is, are you presenting with symptoms? You just said that, you know, if, you, if we didn't know when the HbA1c was and someone had an elevated HbA1c but they were presenting with no symptoms, they wouldn't have ever known that because, you know, nothing's actually going on. Their presentation is completely normal. And I see so many clinicians in terms of the rhetoric online where they, they want to talk, they want to be really, really stringent on maintaining or, or being within the reference ranges on certain things. And if you're outside of the reference ranges, then therefore you're doing something wrong irrespective of whether you are presenting with symptoms or not. Which is just, I mean, you look at the Hippocratic Oath, which is very simply put, do no harm. What that really means, it's, it's very broad because of how vague it is, but it's designed to be that way. Because do no harm in this situation, when you invoke that, it means if someone comes to you if as a clinician and they're presenting with no symptoms, then you're obligated to not intervene in those circumstances. You can do blood tests on them and you can say that something is out of range and say that's food for thought. Interesting. But if you're not presenting with symptoms that would correlate with whatever blood test result was just shown uh, that is colloquially deemed to be bad or good or whatever, then, you know, don't worry about it until it may become an issue and then you can start talking about it. But it goes both ways. It, it's, it's vice versa. You can have an elevated uh, level of something that's abnormal, abnormal ranges and, and have no symptoms, but you can also have something in normal ranges but also be symptomatic directly tied to that level and so that's something that i try and get people to understand they want to be very and i understand why especially people that have had a history of, of disease or something and i'm i'm someone that can definitely talk about having a history of problems like definitely so i understand the, the anxiety that people can have they want to be within the reference ranges because they want to be normal right and i try and tell them well yes but also, no, you want to be normal in terms of your functionality. Um, like, you, you want to have an appropriate functionality, sure, yes, uh, and a functional functionality. But you also want, you don't want to be normal in the sense that, you know, being 95% of the population, <laughs> the average population. So, so you, don't, you don't want to look at simply blood tests and your results on those, especially if you are someone that is suffering from a disease process that you're trying to ameliorate too, because then it gets even more complicated. Like you already do have a, a, a disease process going on, and so you're not even normal to begin with. So why are you even looking at the normative levels of the population? So it gets, it gets very, it's, it's very um, uh, convoluted. And so I, I try and get people to understand that. Um, and the best part... Can I give you a practical example? Yeah, yeah. Could I give you a practical example of that? Yeah. I have many people send me bloods, and they're good. And I say to them, how do you feel? And they say, awful. You know, <laughs> that's it. 150 biomarkers, all in range, and they feel terrible. And they get that classic from the doctor, well, there's nothing wrong with you. Can't find anything wrong with you. And they're like, but there is. There is a quantifiable problem here, you know. So... It, it, you're absolutely right. I mean, I always bang on about symptoms. Do you present with certain symptoms? Because 
Um, yeah, folate would be a good one. That's, that's a great example of a thing that is slightly lower in carnivore. But I always say, why are you worried about it? Have you got bleeding gums? Are your teeth falling out? Are you dizzy? You know, it, it, do you feel very pale and weak? Oh, no, I don't feel any of that. It's the best I've ever felt. Right, okay. Well, maybe you, you're okay with a little bit lower folate than, than you used to have. When, do you remember when you felt really bad and you came to me? <laughs> and it's it's incredible. You know, it's the, it's so deeply ingrained to look at these readings in the wrong way. And, um, you know, they, they have utility. Of course they have utility, but symptoms are the best thing without a shadow of a doubt. Yep. And and the fact that we also have to remember that these these reference ranges, if they are, ba yes, they're based on normative levels of the population, but they're also arbitrarily defined, uh, therefore, in, yeah. in a way. And so it's it, I think uh, I think it's something that Mark Twain once said. It's not what we don't know that gets us in trouble. It's that it's what we know for sure that just ain't so. You know, you know. Oh, we know for <laughs> sure. We know for sure that this is the reference range. This is where you're supposed to be. And then if you get everyone there. But more people are actually becoming symptomatic because it's actually not what their body wants that level to be, and you artificially get it there. Then that will, that, I mean, that will get you in trouble. That will get all the people in trouble, and that's that's something that I really, you know, once again, I, I try and emphasize that. Um, sticking sticking to blood glucose levels and insulin levels. Um, I know that it's been a little bit since we talked about that specifically. We we started with that, and then we got into other topics, but that's it's good. Um, you you reference you you talked about um, being able to portend and predict diabetes development in years in advance because when looking at insulin levels and how they respond to glucose how, how the glucose levels in isolation may not be may, probably aren't a good marker but if you combine glucose levels with an insulin level you can get a better picture even if it's not the full one and so I wanted to ask you, how far in advance can you predict something like diabetes based on an insulin assessment and a glucose assessment? Is, is it something like, can you get to the point where you can predict it a decade before it actually happens? Uh, or is it yeah. just a few years? Yeah. Yeah. 15 years, maybe. I think, I mean, this is a perfect example of the complete opposite of what we just said, where there is utility. But because we're doing it in concert with other things, um, if someone has their blood glucose and it's rocking and rolling, it's really good. And then you think, well, that's fine. Um, most people, like you say, would have been having those insulin measurements because they weren't 100% right. They didn't feel that it was good. So I'm, I'm, I would still stand by symptoms. I don't think people get their bloods taken because they're feeling fantastic. And that's how you can get the historic data of some people's fasted insulin. And you can also see the fasted insulin on... Uh, some of my clients where they they have had bloods taken for a long time and they weren't told they were diabetic and then they were and no one's looked at that fasted insulin going up and i've really got a case live at the moment that's actually doing this uh and there's also a very big influencer who keeps putting their labs up on the screen and they've got fasted insulin going up and up and up and, and claiming that their carbohydrate intake is fantastic so um yeah, that that happens. That happens in in real terms. So you can be not presenting in a way, but uh, know there's something up. And yeah, I would say at least 15 years before. It does depend on the person, the activity. You know, if you're out doing um, high intensity exercise every single day, you can outrun this a little bit. But uh, yeah, I think for the average person, 15, 10 10 years, 15 years, maybe. I think adding that as a standard biomarker in like a well man, well woman test would be just brilliant. First did insulin, absolutely nailed on as a, as a really interesting mark to, marker to add. I would also say see peptide as well, because then you get an proxy marker of the production of insulin. Insulin is notoriously short lived. So um, the uh, C peptide, which is cleaved off from the vesicle when the uh, insulin is produced, well, that's not going to stick around long enough, whereas the C-peptide is, and it's easier to mark as a proxy marker. So you could you could take that fasted insulin, fasted glucose, C-peptide, look at those three and think, yeah, we know what's going on here. We can. I don't like insulin resistance as a term. I think it's all about the cell protecting itself and how sensitive you are to insulin, but going back to your glute, uh, you know, 11 glutes or 14 glutes where most of them aren't insulin dependent it is about the concentration of glucose and i think that we could start looking at it like this talking about it like this forgetting 
what way of eating you're entrenched in and just think, let's get bloods right. Let's get predictive bloods happening. Let's, let's not worry about whether you're a vegan, vegetarian, eating red meat, saturated fat. Or forget all that. Let's actually look at the bloods and let's make them worth something and, and just improve people's health. If someone comes to me and they're vegan, and I, that's fine, I have that. My funny anecdote is in 15 years or 10 years of doing bloods, I've only had three people faint, all vegans, right? But I still see them. And, I, and it's, it's not a problem because they're trying to get their health better. So I, I take my hat off to anyone that's trying to do something. And, and obviously they're coming to have their bloods done because they're trying to discover something. And if you can then say, well, look, you're, I, I can prove that you're going to become diabetic because I've got these markers you can do something now about your carbohydrate intake or you can completely ignore me, but at least accept that we now have some meaningful markers. But if they come in and they have their blood, daily blood glucose reading and it's like fine, it's fine, it's fine. We don't know what's making it fine. We don't know the stress and strain behind the scenes. It's such an easy thing to add, such an easy thing to add. Yeah. And and that seems to get worse. Again, it all ties back to glucose because what would be causing that in the first place? Uh, but it all ties. It, it, it's a, another phenomenon that, that can happen with people uh, that would that would sort of start to raise their insulin that high to keep glucose down at the same level that you can see it over the course of however many years testing only glucose. Uh, without the context of what your insulin is doing in, in the process. Uh, the other th the, the thing that can cause that is if you get, you know, fatter and fatter over over the course of a few uh, however many years you'll become what's colloquially deemed insulin resistant for a completely different reason than what we what i usually invoke which is the randall cycle and stuff like that uh the fat cells cannot take up any more glucose or any substrate because they've become maximally hyper, uh, hypertrophied and then depending on your mm. genetic outset that will determine um how many more fat cells you can produce and if you run if you hit that limit well, then insulin will start to creep up to try and keep glucose levels down even more because glucose can't get into fat cells to, you know, fill them up. And they, they function as very, very, very poor basins uh, at that point for glucose. Um, but I wanted to, okay, so, so with, with, with blood glucose, uh, again, I think this will be the last question, maybe the second to last question I ask on this topic. Um, <laughs> why can carnivores' blood glucose levels be higher homeostatically in the, in the presence of, of what we would deem to be appropriate insulin responses uh so not not super elevated or anything uh why can they be what's considered to be higher you know above the normative range homeostatically or basally uh, as compared to someone who's consuming carbohydrates regularly and just, just to give more context here um paul saladino uh everyone knows who he is there was there was a time where when he started when he recently reintroduced carbohydrates back in um, as much as there are many confounders when you do blood tests, we'll just give them the benefit of the doubt here. And we'll say that everything was hypothetically controlled. He had shown that many blood tests that he had taken before he had introduced carbohydrates back in, his, his fasting glucose was still within normative ranges, but it was higher than it was whenever he introduced carbohydrates back in. And so my question is, what would be the reason behind that? I have a theory as to why that's the case. Now, does that matter too much in terms of overall health? We just covered no, because whatever your body's doing is exactly what it should be doing, given the circumstances. And if you feel better without carbohydrates than you do with carbohydrates, despite the fact that your glucose may be higher, it doesn't matter, right? But I, people are concerned about that because I've seen that happen before. I've gotten many emails about it before. Why is my glucose going up, even if my insulin is normal, right? Why is the glucose basally, homeostatically, still elevated? despite me not consuming carbs. Do you have an answer for that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, it is a little bit multifactorial. Normally it is slightly lower levels of insulin. When you say fasted insulin is low, it's normally slightly lower than it has been. Um, so what's the point of, what's the point of um, insulin? Well, it, it will get glucose into the cell like maybe 10 times the faster than diffusion for instance so uh, a lower level will mean that the, there is a little bit more glucose kicking about S secondly we're we're getting bogged down with what is optimal and what is the right range who's to say that 80 milligrams per deciliter is perfect what who's been a long-term carnivore uh, and is reasonably active maybe 100 is actually optimal 
I mean, this, this is the thing. This is why I like to take a step back. Because, again, that question is predisposed on assumptions, which is not knocking you, Eddie, because it's a, it's a valid question. This is the question I get asked. Right. Let's put this in perspective, okay? If you go from 80 to 100, what does that actually mean? Well, that is one gram of glucose in your five and a half litres of blood, okay? And people worry about a can of Coke. No, they don't. That's nine teaspoons, all right? We are talking, you know, one gram, 25% of a teaspoon extra in five and a half litres. Maybe that's what we need. Um, and and uh, so I'm, what I'm trying to do is like, a, what's your point of reference? You have that much, you have much higher. See, this is it. You said it. We all say it. It's much higher now. It used to be 80 and now it's 90. Or, um, you know, you could, if you were facetious, go, <laughs> big deal. <laughs> wow. What are we talking here? We're not even talking a gram in five and a half litres. I mean, people look at that, you know, five and a half litres, big bottles of water, imagine those with blood, and you getting a teaspoon and go, oh, no, that's too much. You know, half a teaspoon, oh, that's too much. A little tiny bit, oh, wow, that's way too much. I'm freaking. Right, but so maybe that's the energy demand of somebody that's operating maximally. Your brain function, right, a big thing that happens. We all know that your brain is one of those wonderful sinks of a huge turnover of energy. What's another thing, Carnival? My mental clarity went up. I think clearer. Well, hang on a minute. You need some more energy. Well, how are you going to get that? Then? Hang on a minute. We don't need insulin in the brain. Okay, we'll just get it up there. And we'll let it diffuse nicely based on its concentration. So I could, I could spend an hour answering this, but I, th I think it's something not even to worry about. That's, that's my point. If, if it went from, say, 100 to 300 or like diabetics come in sometimes it's 250 we've, we've got a problem Houston definitely but that's never what the case is that is never the case it's always like from 80 to 90 sometimes it's 90 to 105 um, I just think the context the context is lacking to um, look at things broader so if people are worried about that and they're saying wow you know this is this is terrible these are sort of the proponents of eating 300 grams of carbs come on we're talking about an increase of a gram in your blood but you're prepared to eat 300 grams i think you're not looking at this right you're not doing the joined up thinking so that would be my initial answer but i'm dying to hear your your answer actually well the, yeah the first thing that i'll that i'll Add before I even answer the question as to why that may be the case, in terms of what I believe is the reason, uh, which I think is a very obvious reason. Once I say it, people will be like, "Oh, that makes sense." Um, but what I always try and get people to understand is, okay, even if your glucose level is higher, if you're not consuming carbs, then that means that necessarily that glucose came from your liver. Your body produced mm -hmm. that glucose. Oh yeah. Your body, yes, it's demand driven. It's demand driven. It's gluconeogenesis, which yeah. means that process is 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 encoded for by your genes, according to the circumstances in which they are placed, and nothing else. Which means that necessarily, that glucose was indicated to have been produced. Now, if that glucose, I always say, and this is very, very, very rare. I've never actually heard this occurring before or heard of this occurring before. But if you are able to measure and, and see that you are sustaining excess glycation damage, and I say excess because we're always sustaining some level of glycation damage because glucose is reactive. It's, it's the entire reason why our HbA1c will never hit 0%, no matter what diet you're on. It's always going to be there, mm -hmm. right? Um, but if you're able to see that it's it's in excess and you're not consuming carbohydrates and it's from gluconeogenesis, it's not the glucose production still. It is not the glucose production that is the problem. It is something else that is the underpinning problem, like, for example, inflammation, which will cause your liver to produce a lot of glucose in many circumstances. And so you have to target the root problem. The root problem is not your genes producing something according to their positive and negative selection pressures that occurred over the course of billions of years. <laughs> you know, that's, that's not the problem. In terms of why it may be the case, just to entertain curiosity, you know, here, um, well, it's just like what you said. If you are spiking your insulin a lot because you're consuming a lot of carbs and you, you get it to drop and spike and drop and spike and drop, it may very well be the case that your fasting glucose would be a little lower because you have higher insulin, which would drop according to certain circumstances. Yes. It will drop 
the glucose level. Now, of course, it's not going to drop it too much because then you'll become hypoglycemic. And we have about, you know, it's just like what you were saying. It's a very small amount of glucose that we're talking about between 80 to 100 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, in the case of the uh, total amount that's supposed to be in your blood at any given instance in time, we're talking four teaspoons, I believe. Or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, four grams, which is one teaspoon. But you've got four grams that are pulsing through your blood. So even the tiniest amount of glucose can cause a significant increase in a measurement like milligrams per deciliter of glucose. So that's also something that people should mm -hmm. understand because how much absolute glucose are we really talking about? You know, it's really great to report relative outcomes as opposed to not putting them alongside absolute outcomes so that we can get a better picture. You know, that's also really important. Um, so yes, I do believe, of course, it, it would make sense if you're exhibiting lower insulin all the time, homeostatically, and you're getting, and you're eating one meal a day, for example, and you're getting a bump once a day and it's nowhere near a spike because mm -hmm. you're not consuming glucose. Well, you know, you may very well have more glucose in the blood at any given instance in time, but if it's produced by your body, then you can guarantee that it is exactly how much the body needs at the yep. in those circumstances. Um, and that was actually a good point yep. that you talked about. If, if you have better mental clarity in your in your your parts of your body, you're working better than they ever were able to before. Then, of course, they, they it's a pretty good it's a judicious assertion to say, oh, OK, it may need more energy. And again, when we say more, we're talking this much more according to those hypothetical yes. values you just threw out there. So is it really that big of a deal? I really don't think so. And so I'm glad that we actually got into that. Um, but on, on the topic of this is the last thing I'll ask on it, because we talked about how <laughs> unreliable HbA1c values are. We've talked about even blood glucose levels in isolation without any context. Uh, for example, without the context of what diet are you on, and also the context of insulin. Um, what do you think about a fructosamine assay being used instead of an HbA1c? Do you think it can give you a better picture of what, if you, a, a better picture of the glycation rate that's occurring in your body and whether it's, you know, appropriate or not, so in excess or not, or do you think it is also in some ways unreliable? Or both, because those aren't mutually exclusive, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it can be unreliable if you interpret them wrong. I mean, that, that's the thing. So fructosamine, just to make it clear, is not fructose, all right? That's just a name of uh, protein having glucose stuck to it, and it's just because of uh, it looks like fructose. It really is that simple, but it isn't uh, fructose. So um, any, any protein that has glucose stuck to it is... Uh, becomes fructosamine uh, the normal one they look at is albumin which is approximately a half life of, of, of 20 days and the utility of this is it's a much quicker indicator of glycation i suppose again one of the big things i like to do is just get the whole point across what's the point of these measurements well we're not worried about albumin being glycated we're talking all cells so again it's a proxy marker for overall total systemic glycation on many many cells so fructosamine is handy because it can give you a much quicker turnaround of for instance if you're looking at uh, in your early period of time when you're looking at diabetic medications for instance it's going to give you a real quick what's happening over three weeks rather than you know a, a theoretical average of three months so it, it it's pretty good um uh i think you know the the way it's tested is, is, is exceptionally um, reliable. So I think it is a good test. I would prefer it, the HbA1c, because it is more of a direct measurement uh, rather than an estimation and a calculation and, and, uh, and all that sort of stuff. So they do like in vitro studies. That's, that's how they do it. And they assess that actual effect. So I think for me, it's, it's a more useful test. It's not the be all and end all. I think it, it's definitely got some something going for it. Uh, more, more and more, of my clients are doing it off the, you know, off their own backs because they feel it's interesting. It does seem to be more in tune with their actual blood glucose uh, monitors and their uh, continual glucose monitors. Whether there's utility in it, I don't know um, because it's, it's. I've not seen enough. One of the things I do, Eddie, is I don't talk much until I've got lots and lots of data. That's so a, it's a good habit to have. It's, it's, it's a, that's a good habit to have because most people online are not like that. They're the exact opposite. They like to say a bunch of things before they know anything about the topic. So good, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good habit. So yes, I have. I, I mean, I have got enough to sort of talk about it in general, but it took me a thousand clients before I sort of said, "Yeah, maybe I am the black 
the blood's guy. Maybe I am. And a lot of success in different areas where we were sort of biohacking. Um, so for, for me, I think ask in a year's time. I do think it's becoming more popular, so I'll have a lot more to say on it maybe in a year's time. But it's definitely out there. And if if it was, this is very uh, early to say, but if someone said to me, what's got more utility, the HbA1c or fructose, I mean, I'd absolutely go for the fructose, I mean. But in the context of other things, still, that's important. Yeah, I was going to say, any test in isolation is not going to have that much utility, uh, absolute no. utility. You have to combine it with, you know, if you do a fructosamine and an HbA1c and a reticulocyte production rate and you do all these other things, then you can get a better picture, right? So in terms of isolating yes. one test and saying how much utility does it have, well, it depends on the context. It depends on what other tests are alongside it. You know, if, if, if a clinician or some, or someone like you, you know, actually was was posed with, was presented with that information, you know, on, on paper, you know, if it was just a fructosamine, it wouldn't really have that much utility until you put it right side, uh, right next to all the other things. So I wanted to talk, just a quick note on this, because some people I've heard worry about this as well. Um, can carnivores expect their, I, I just sort of, I already know the answer to this question, but, you know, I wanted to hear your take on it. Can, can carnivores expect their iron or ferritin levels to be elevated? And if so, is that a concern? Why or why not? <laughs> well, it's a great question, but I think it's also one of those things that um, if you understand the mechanism of what ferritin is and how it's stored and how there's so many misconceptions about iron, um, then it, it's definitely worth addressing. So with with iron, um, you tend to get sort of a, a, a panel of labs, which is serum iron, transferrin, transferrin, saturation, and ferritin is, an, is another one of those markers. Now, um, where do we get our iron from when when we're eating? Yeah, well, definitely when we've got red meat, we get heme iron, it's great, Fe2, ferrous iron, is, it's fantastic. That's really good. But that's not the only way we get iron. The other way we get iron, and it's going to loop back to the HbA1c, is the recycling of red blood cells. What happens, so, you know, again, give you some sort of context, 180 million red blood cells are made every minute in the average person. So if you're living longer, you don't get 180 million, you might get 120 million made every minute. And why is that important with iron? Because the recycling of red blood cells splits up the haemoglobin into heme and globin, and heme is recycled. So you get this wonderful, wonderful usage of heme iron coming back into the body. So you would um, expect the body to be really smart and go, hang on a minute, this is reduced by a third. What's going on? This guy is eating a pound of meat, but we used to get this other iron as well. So it will definitely detect that. So stick with me, Eddie, all right? So so once we get into that, there's other ways of getting iron. So you can get it from your fruit and veg, and you get Fe3+, plus, and that's not heme iron. When you eat that, the enterocytes will have to use um, vitamin C ferroreductase, which has vitamin C coming into it, to make it into ferrous, to, into um, Fe2+, plus, to make it ferrous. So... We need to understand that when we're comparing the bloods and the need for vitamin C, this is a huge part because if you're eating heme iron, you don't need so much vitamin C. So that's just another tick box for the people that say you need a lot of vitamin C. Yeah, you do if you're eating a lot of green leafy veg because of that iron conversion, which isn't particularly good, by the way. So anyway, once it gets into the enterocytes, there's a thing called mucosal ferritin. Not talked about very much, but it is a storage form of ferritin. You also have it in macrophages, bones everywhere. It's, it's, it's pretty important. Storage form of iron is ferritin. So um, the other thing that people say, you can't get rid of iron unless you go and have therapeutic um, phlebotomy. Well, that does work, but it messes everything up. You mentioned an influencer who does this, and that's why their bloods are pretty irrelevant, because they're messing with everything by doing that therapeutic um, phlebotomy but let's say you're not doing that how do you get rid of iron well actually your enterocytes if you've got a healthy gut this is another thing that's really important they will recycle every four days the entire entirety will be completely new after four days so if you're on carnivore what's happening to all that ferritin <laughs> it's going it's leaving you it's going out so you've got this much lower production or recycling, I should say, of heme coming from the red blood cells. You've also got your gut lining um, stripping off all the mucosal ferritin. That's going out of the system. So 
what I'm saying is you're losing ferritin and you're losing uh, heme iron on a regular basis. So your body will upregulate storage because it's looking at these two things. It's not, it's not pathological, it's physiological. It's actually measuring what's going on. This is what we should have. So going back to these ranges, all those ranges are assuming that you've got really bad um, gut health. Uh, this is so many different studies on this, but we know there's less incidence of cancer in that healthy gut because of the rapid recycling. Cancer doesn't grow where there's rapid recycling. So we know this is all sort of uh, the me the mechanism is all there, and this does definitely happen. So that that's being dumped. So we are now a different animal. We're diff we're different when we're carnivore. We're back to we're resetting to back to how we should be. So those high levels of ferritin are actually sensible levels of ferritin. Now I'm not saying ignore high ferritin in the context of other things. If you've got high serum iron, if you've got other higher things, you've got symptoms, then it's another thing to look at. Why is that? But Many people don't have that. They just say, my ferritin's a bit high. My doctor said my ferritin's a bit high. My, my physician is saying, I need to watch that ferritin. Why do you need to watch it? Why do you need? What, what's it going to do? It's not, it's not in your blood. It's in storage. It's where it should be, in macrophages, in bones. It's all over the place. It's in your enterocytes, in the, mu the mucosal layer. So it knows what it's doing. It does definitely know. Now, I guarantee that you could manipulate your ferritin levels by going on a vegetarian diet. That would plummet. But why would that be? Well, that's because you're just deregulating absolutely everything. <laughs> absolutely everything. And you will be eating tons of green... Oh, it's, it's just, to me, it just seems really obvious that the way we're eating, you just have to uh, factor in our production of iron. And this is why you get very pale-looking vegetarians and vegans, very pale skin, you know, fatigue... Because their iron management is, is just shot to pieces because they're not eating heme iron and they're just putting a huge strain on the system. You know, this is why they need vitamin C and this is, this is where it's all coming in. And you're not going to get much storage in the gut. And, you know, notoriously their gut lining is not particularly great. Um, so it's just understanding it, really, that the high number is not high. It is appropriate. If we take a step back and say, why is that happening? And you factor in the red blood cell turnover of haemoglobin and you look at the um, mucosal ferritin. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've usually, I've told people, I, I say the only time that on carnivore, um, a ferritin level would even indicate a problem is if it's extremely high, which in, case, in which case you'd probably have symptoms and all that. And also you, you mentioned the... Uh, you know the actual bullet levels of iron as well alongside again with context you can't just look at ferritin you have to look at the context of, of the whole system um or if you have one of the forms of anemia that paradoxically leads to really high ferritin levels right because you can't access the the iron yeah. for for use uh that that's that's that'll be a, an issue but it always goes back to well you'd be symptomatic then if you were anemic You'd actually have symptoms of anemia, so it would it would indicate a problem. I I had, I had no idea about. I, I of course knew that the the form of iron found in plants is the elemental iron versus the heme iron that's found in in animal products. And I also was aware that heme iron is more bioavailable than elemental iron. I did not know though that probably the reason why is because of what you just said. The thing I very the very thing I didn't know, which is that. The conversion process of the elemental iron to heme iron in the enterocytes uses things like vitamin C and all that stuff. And it seems like it seems like if we weren't given the fact that our the the carnivorous diet is our species appropriate diet and the, and the diet that we evolved consuming for millions of years, I would suspect that our capacity in our body to perform that conversion process is much lower than one would. Then would be, then would be of utility for someone that was actually consuming elemental iron to get to an optimal level of of iron or ferritin for their body. Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd suspect that that's probably what influences the bioavailability difference between elemental iron and then heme iron. Um, I I would almost guarantee that that's the case. I had no idea that that was actually the conversion process though, and that it utilized vitamin C. So now I want to look into that. Uh, I had no idea about that. Um, 
Uh, with the with the iron panel, what you just said about the very high iron, the, the iron panel is is really telling as well because you get serum iron. So uh, just to make it easy for the people listening, imagine little balls of iron, little ball bearings of iron in your blood, um, and then you've got what's called uh, transferrin, which is the thing that moves it. I mean, the transferrin, uh, and then you get what's called transferrin saturation. So imagine that this protein has got little holes for the ball bearings. And uh, there's four holes, but only two are filled. So your your saturation is 50%. So the body has, has the proteins to transport, you know, more iron. But it's choosing not to. You know, this this is the thing. You're, you're big on this. I'm big on this. It chooses not to. So you can get these different readings. You can also even have unbind, uh, unbound iron binding capacity. You can really work out exactly how your body is partitioning iron, where it's putting into storage, where it's just moving it in the bloodstream, what is free and available. And then you get into, you know, really truly understanding the whole system. It's... This is one of the things I did want to touch on. Um, when people get their bloods and they say, I've got a full set, a full, I've got a full iron panel, they very rarely have. You want, you want serum iron, you want TIBC, UIBC, you want transferrin, transferrin saturation. That gives you, there's even more, but let, <laughs> that's enough to be getting on with. Uh, that will give you a really good uh, window into what is happening with your iron. And then the, the, the other thing that people say is, well, I've, got, I've tested for the hemochromatosis gene, haven't got it. Whew, that's fine. I said, well, you know, there are 15 other tests you could do because you could still have it. So it's like, um, uh, you know, an upsetting thing because everyone does make it very reductive and, oh, you're going to get iron overload and that's why you've got high ferritin. Well, actually, no. High ferritin is high storage. That's not overload. Overload is where it is in your blood. And, you know, so they're not even saying the right things. And again, symptoms. Well, have you got symptoms of iron uh, overload? So I think that's. Uh, I'm glad you asked about that because that that is a that is a good question to ask. Yeah. Um, just to finish off here, are there any you know <laughs> elephant in the room? Maybe to some people, uh, I didn't actually mention the LDL uh, test or, or markers or cholesterol yeah. markers, and it's pro it's really because I focus so much on it on my channel as to how they are also extremely redundant at least in isolation at the very least in isolation just like every other test is effectively redundant when it's only present in isolation um and but even with ldl tests and all that stuff even within the context of other cholesterol the lipoproteins and total cholesterol numbers and triglycerides and all that stuff they still uh this this differs uh this is a difference between th that type of panel the lipid panel versus other panels that you were just talking about like the like an iron you know, panel, um, in that even within the context of all those other markers, it seems to still be redundant uh, because of cholesterol's role in heart disease or lack thereof uh, in many ways. And so I didn't add it on here, but if you wanted to talk about it, that's fine because my last question was, are there any blood tests or other blood tests that you would like to talk about uh, that you think are important to talk about um, for people's awareness uh, that maybe, you know, vexing people right now and, and war making them worry <laughs> well i think the the worry about ldl uh, low density lipoproteins which aren't cholesterol they're low density lipoproteins which contain cholesterol mm -hmm. i i find gobsmacking that people think there is an issue here and and people i respect as well still think that there's an issue here and yes you can look at particle size you can look at small dents and you can look at fluffy and buoyant uh, ldl and all the subfractions you can do all that yes you can look at vldl uh vldl is interesting actually as a great marker for whether you're fat adapted but we'll come into that another time i think so the lipid panel is interesting in other areas like triglyceride hdl ratio but even then, I still feel the thrombotic theory of um, atherosclerotic plaques is, is much more convincing. Uh, but I would, I, would, I would just say, I think a lot of it, LDL leads me on to something like, say, uric acid, right, where, where people worry about high levels of uric acid. Now, when I, uh, before the restrictions, I used to have a personal face-to-face -face rehab clinic and uh, deal with joint pain and stuff like that. I have specialism in lower back pain. And... Um, you would have people with high uric acid and they would have no joint pain. Uh, 
and you would have people with very low uric acid and they would have terrible gout. So to me, the common sense test, mm, that doesn't work. That does not work because it doesn't work. <laughs> it's that simple. You couldn't look at bloods and go, oh, wow, this person's going to come in and they are going to have such bad gout. That uric acid is off the charts. That never happened. All right, That never happened. But a lot of times there would be other factors. And this is, this is, I suppose, what I want to say to people is don't firstly immediately believe the word high means bad or low means bad. Someone has added that. Um, or subclinical. So I'm going to just talk a couple of little examples to, to sort of try and do a broad stroke. So if you look at thyroid, look at the thyroid panel. I had someone come in very worried. Their TSH is subclinical. It's been subclinical for four years. I said, right, okay, we've got all your bloods. We've got all your TSH, T4, T3 for the last four years. So let's have a look at your subclinical. So 0 0.4 to four was the range for TSH, and he was 0 0.3 around, four years running. But his T4 was always pretty much slap bang in the middle of the range of 10 to 20, T4. So I said to him, thought experiment, you're the first person that's ever given blood, and I'm the first person that's ever looked at thyroid panel, and I'm gonna work out the ranges, okay? What's the main point of thyroid stimulating hormone? Well, first, it's not a thyroid hormone. It's stimulating the thyroid to make T4, right? Well, yours is perfect every year. So I'm going to say the range is pretty much what you're producing. That's the range. The range has got to be zero to maybe 0 0.4, not 0 0.4 to, to 4, because your 3.7, 3.5, 3.6, your subclinical thing is perfect. So I want people to look at that example and think right don't believe subclinical low high look at the context what is the hormone supposed to do and is it doing it if it's doing it it's not low it's not high it's it's the range it should be it's the number it should be I hate numbers with an absolute passion now the ldl why i think that's interesting is because why is LDL implicated? Well, we know about feeding rabbits the wrong food and we know about the Sugar Research Foundation and the fraud. We know all about that. But we also know that it's associated. It's in the vicinity and there's always the, the boring analogy that everyone uses. You're blaming the fireman for the fire. All right. Well, uric acid is another classic example of that. Uric acid is a known antioxidant. Okay. It's known as that. So why is it problematic? Well, it's problematic because some people have problems and their uric acid is high. Not everybody, but some. And it's enough for people to go, duh, there's the problem. It's that high uric acid. If we lower that high uric acid, we're going to be all right. This is real allopathic medicine idiocy. I mean, it really is because it's not lowering the thing that matters. It's, it's lowering the cause. So... Often, very often in practice, and, and even now with remote, the person is eating a lot of fruit, a lot of fruit. And we know that fruit is metabolized in the liver, and it absolutely burns through ATP to do that metabolizing, right? And then we end up with AMP because there's phosphor, phosphorylation. What is the end product after that? Uric acid. Simple as that. It's really simple. Well, it isn't as simple as that, but let's say it's as simple as that. That's the main thing people should be looking at. Depleting cellular ATP because you're eating too much fruit and therefore your liver is struggling to get rid of all that fructose, you're going to get high levels of uric acid. But what happens is most people that eat a lot of fruit, or let's put it the other way, most people with a lot of gout eat a lot of fruit or they have fructose and they're blaming the uric acid. So we can go right back full circle. So they said it is nice. It's not the glucose <laughs> that's the problem. All those numbers are showing you the glucose is too much. Well, it's not the uric acid that's a problem. It's what you're doing beforehand that makes the uric acid that number. And uh, you knock out the fructose, alcohol as well, obviously. Anything that's metabolized in the liver, which those two things are a big culprits of, that burn up the ATP, you're going to see a high level of uric acid. It really is that simple. That's not even controversial. Everyone knows that. Everyone knows that that is the thing. Um, yes, uric acid is also, um, this might be something you've never heard before, but uric acid will actually increase your blood pressure. 
So is that a problem? Well, it might be a problem if you look at it the wrong way, because I believe that what's happening there is increasing the excretion rate from the kidneys. That's why it's putting the blood pressure up. It's getting more blood through the kidney at a faster rate, and therefore you'll be able to excrete the metabolites that the body doesn't want. So I think even that has a physiological uh, element to it. A bit like when people say... um, when your cortisol goes high, you, well, I hope they say this, your body physiologically gives you sort of insulin resistance. Well, of course it does, because cortisol is trying to raise your blood sugar. You don't want your body fighting this mechanism. So it's going to make you resistant to putting glucose in this. It makes total sense. So I think this is what we need. So am I the blood guy? Possibly. But I'm just thinking about it differently rather than accepting everything I read and and going, well, actually, why would that do that? Because it makes more sense when you look at these things. So, yeah, uric acid has a thing on ENOS, it's called the nitric acid oxide thing. But why? You know, the body doesn't do things because it's idiotic. All right, and then if you go, if you sort of reverse engineer it, well, what's happened? What causes that? Well, that causes that. That causes that. Causes that. That's the reason. If we can go to the roots, then we can understand the numbers, join it all together, and do something practical. All right. So, you got high uric acid, just reduce your fructose. That's it. Don't drink alcohol. Just help your liver out, or get into understanding what it's doing. And it's not high, it's a level that your body has decided. I am not saying that the body is incredibly smart, that it never goes wrong, by the way. It goes wrong. But it goes wrong because we do stuff to it that we shouldn't be doing. Even too much water, and don't get me on that one, by the way, uh, but too much water is very damaging, very, very damaging. So it's just eating the right amount, drinking when you're thirsty, stopping when you're quenched, eating when you're hungry, and stopping when you're full. Really simple. Eat the right things. And uh, the numbers, you don't need to worry about. Yeah. At the, at the end of the day, it always go, I, I, am, I am astonished, and I've said this in my videos before, I'm astonished at how I can sit in front of a camera, in front of a, in front of a computer screen, and simply get paid for saying the two most obvious and trite things. First of all, that being glucose is not required for human physiology, gluconeogenesis, and most relevant to this, Association does not equal causation. I sit here, and that's the majority of the claims I make, and and it it, it gets people like I, I get views for it because, like I, I was telling people, I, was, I I said I said in one of my videos I, I looked at the camera, and I said, if you think that's too easy, if you think that it's not fair that I'm able to say that stuff and get paid, don't blame me. Blame all these people that want to say things like uric acid causes gout because it's associated with gout. Or it's, it, it, things are associated with something else. Uh, it, it's 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 absolutely ridiculous. It's the first thing you learn in not even statistics. A lot of people say it's the it's the first thing you learn in statistics. It's the first thing. It's one of the first things you learn in school in general, because it's so prevalent all throughout our lives. You know, you do, just because you see that something is associated with something else does not mean that it causes something else. And that's very 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 important in the context of uric acid and gout. Uh, just like what you said, just because you exhibit high uric acid levels or present with them does not necessarily mean that you will have gout uh, and vice versa as well. Yes, uric acid is a result of, of, of purine breakdown. So AMP would be one of the, you have your, your purine pool in your cells, that being AMP, ADP, ATP, PI, all that stuff, all the phosphate, you know, um, based mm-hmm. compounds. And if you have enough of AMP breakdown, you'll get, yeah, you'll get an increase in uric acid. But just like what you said, fructose is involved in that. But so is, sure, fine, um, when you consume protein. Well, of course, because it, it's purine breakdown. But the context matters because if two different things are the primary drivers of uric acid production, well, then you're going to have to not only look at uric acid as the cause of whatever, you know, whatever the cause of the gout presentation is, you're going to have to look at what's causing that increase in uric acid, or in, in the case of, you know, it's the pedant in me, it's, it's your rate at the, at the body's pH, but that's just, it, it, you know, that's just my pedantic brain kicking in. Um, <laughs> and and the, in the case of, yeah, we, we know that fructose is a problem for many, many other reasons. Could they, could glycation and the AGE formation, advanced glycation end product formation, be causing joint pain? 
and also people that consume a lot of fructose are consuming a lot of other things that may also cause gout to occur. You know, could the, could all those be possibilities? Well, the answer is yes. And so, yeah, it's, I think it's a good idea. I, I could cut your fructose, in, which involves things like cutting out fruit, which not only includes fructose, but also includes a, lo- a large amount of the glucose that people consume and the sucrose that people consume and the fiber that people consume and the deuterium that people consume. So it's all of this stuff that may result <laughs> in absolutely a, um, an amelioration of gout or at least a reduction in the, in the symptom presentation. Um, but... Anyway, um, I this was this was a good conversation. We went on for thirty minutes longer than I thought, which is good. It's not a bad thing. Um, but <laughs> I I wanted to thank you for coming on, uh, of course. And this will probably, uh, hopefully, not be the last conversation uh, that we have, at least uh, for my channel um, or for or for yours in terms of the conversations we did previously. Um, but where can people find you um, if they want more information or just want to hear you uh, talk more about anything else? <laughs> yeah, cool. Uh, well, my YouTube channel is uh, the YouTube at Coach Stephen. Uh, my uh, website is the UK Carnivore.com. Simple as that, the UK Carnivore.com. Uh, I'm also on Instagram as the UK Carnivore and Twitter, the UK Carnivore. Um, you will find me. Uh, those places. I also have a school community with my co-host Richard Smith. We do live question and answers every Sunday in the UK, 7 p.m. Uh, for an hour. We answer questions live, and then we go over to our school community, which is a small monthly fee, and we do lots of stuff there. If you want to really ask us questions and and drill down into these details a bit more. Awesome. Okay, I will link all of those in the description below like I do with everyone else that I interview. And once again, thanks for coming on. It was once again long anticipated because we had two conversations before this one uh, a few weeks ago. So it was finally mm-hmm. finally able to get getting get you on was uh was really really um, informative and fun. Can I t- tag on that I also have books. I have a the guide to blood tests in the context low carb keto and carnivore and how to be carnivore. And even have a cookbook, which is hiding around there, around the back of that chair. So, kind of a cookbook. Awesome. (laughs) All right. Well, we will definitely talk again soon. So, thank you for coming on once again. (laughs) Okay. It's been a pleasure.